BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello and welcome to a new series of Political Thinking, a conversation with, rather than an interrogation of, someone who shapes our political thinking about what has shaped theirs. My guest this week is the leader of Britain's second largest trade union, Sharon Graham, who replaced the rather better known Len McCluskey. We're talking at a time when there are strikes in the health service, strikes on the railway, strikes in schools, strikes in the civil service. For years, there's been talk of a new winter of discontent. And let's be honest, it has been largely that talk. Now, though, trade unions do have a mandate from their members. They seem to have the backing of large sections of the public to have a fight over the standard of their members living. Sharon Graham, welcome to Political Thinking. Thank you. You've been a trade unionist all of your adult life, an activist all of your adult life. Have you ever seen a more important year for trade unionism than this one? Well, I think it's definitely important. And actually, I think, you know, just hearing in your intro there, Nick, I think that actually it is a moment, but it's one that's been brewing for a number of years. For 10 years, you've had people in the public and the private sector basically not getting pay rises. And what's different between now and then is that what they were able to do then was maybe just get by, you know, just pull those two ends together to get by. What's happening now is they just literally cannot get by. And therefore, because of that, um, the, the email I get the most actually at the moment is when is when are we going on strike? So because of that, people are feeling they have to do this in order to get the money in their pockets to feed their families. Now, because you've been around a long time yes. in the union movement, you've got perspective on this. Does this feel like the beginning of a new balance of power in the workplace, maybe in society more generally? Or is it a one-off? We've got particularly high global inflation, particularly high inflation here, and therefore it's a one-off moment at which people are trying to make sure they don't get a real wage cut. Yeah, I actually don't think it's a one-off moment. Um, I think it's uh, definitely uh, moving towards something. And I think part of that was because what happened in the pandemic. People saw in the pandemic that it was everyday people that went out to fight it. Bin workers, bus workers, train workers, uh, obviously NHS workers, but mostly people who were paid less money in society, that they were sent out there. And at the time, we didn't know if there was going to be a vaccine. We didn't know any of these things. And they were asked to go out there and deal. They went out there to deal. And when they came back, they were ignored. And I think as a society... Everybody has got empathy and sympathy with that. And also because they're going through the same thing. So I actually think that the genie's out of the bottle. I think actually the game's up, I have to tell you. Uh, and I think people are realising that it is workers and everyday people who are the ones that keep this economy going. Now, that phrase used to make trade unionists groan, really, because it was used as a stick, wasn't it, to attack you? The winter of discontent, mm. the time the unions helped, it was alleged, bring down a, a Labour government. And I, in my journalistic career, constantly told, is it a new winter of discontent? And the answer was, it never really was mm. actually a new winter. It kind of feels like it might be. Do you think it is this time? Well, I mean, I'm, we're doing bingo with the cliches because, of course, they're coming out thick and fast from around, from around the patch. But um, look, I, I, what I think is, is that we have got a very unequal society and we have had for years and years and years. And I think what we need to do is look at the solutions to that now. We can't tinker around the edges anymore. It's, it is completely broken. And I'll just give you one example that I think is important on this. If you take the health dispute and the groaning about can we afford it, is it going to put up inflation, etc., if you look at the profiteering in this country currently, £170 billion excess profit, more than usual profit with the energy companies. We've got a black hole supposedly of £40 billion. Why can't we just have £50 billion of the excess profit, get the black hole done with the £40 billion, £6.2 billion for the NHS to get a 10% pay rise, you've got money over. Why is that such a odd choice to make. These companies have gained in the crisis. They should pay for the crisis and not ask workers to pay for the crisis. So that, in other words, is your answer to ministers who mm. say to you, and Unite does have ambulance workers as members, as well as the, the better known public service unions, your message to them is you could afford it if you wanted it. Absolutely, 100%. They can afford it if they want it and if the will is there for them to do it, 100%. And are you going to join, because we know there's a big mm. day of action, I mean, it's a whole series of days, but there's a particularly big day coming up on February the 6th in which nurses from the Royal College of Nursing, ambulance workers, paramedics mm. and like, largely represented by GMB or Unison are going on strike. 
Are your members going to join? Yes, they are. But they're also fighting for the NHS itself. People are dying as we speak because of waiting times and the clogging up of the NHS. So we have announced six further days of action um, and we will be on strike that day, yes. For you who largely represent people in the private Mm. sector, does it raise different questions for you? Does it make you pause? The question that you know that you always get when paramedics, people in call centres go on strike, which is, hold on, this potentially threatens lives. It certainly increases the suffering of people, increases their anxiety. Does it make you pause more than a conventional dispute? Well, look, yes, because, of course, nobody wants lives to be lost. And we are really careful, irrespective of the lies, I have to say, that's been said by some ministers, uh, to make sure that in the ambulance dispute, I was on the picket line in the West Midlands, that we had proper... Uh, minimum cover, because that is something that's really important to us. So obviously we do it in a way that we try not to have any difficulties from that. But I have to say, lives are being lost now. There was a a piece that came out yesterday, so they believe 500 excess lives have been lost a week because of waiting times. And so something has to be done. And if they don't solve the pay crisis, they can't solve the crisis of the workforce, which means that the NHS is on its knees. So it's really important that Rishi Sunat comes to the table. I've said this before. He is the ultimate decision maker. He is the person that if this was in an outside dispute in the private sector me and him would be speaking. Um, He won't come to the table. Now, that's either because he doesn't know what to do, so then he's not up to the job, or there's another reason why he will not solve this dispute. Well, there probably is another reason that he won't come to the table, which is, you know, Tories over the years have said, we're not going back to, let's use another of those cliches, beer and sandwiches with the trade unions. We're not going back to the days of the winter of discontent in which... People like you, who admittedly represent lots of people, Mm. think they can go toe-to-toe or face-to-face or eye-to-eye with the Prime Minister. He thinks that's a bad thing to do. Listening to you, Mm. I find it very hard to see a solution to this particular pay crisis. Is this going to go on for months? Well, look, there is a solution, and that's the thing. For the stakeholders to get round the table, and, of course, they can talk about beer and sandwiches and things that are in a bygone era that, quite frankly, most people don't remember. What we're talking about, uh, the leaders of the union, is to effectively say, look, we are the lead negotiators with our reps. Come to the table because you are the lead negotiators for the government, who is the employer in this instance, and we want to do a deal. Our members want to do a deal. But you can see that the public, uh, I saw a survey yesterday, are with these workers. So, actually... He's elected in. Listen to your public if you're not listening to anybody else. And so we're clear, if they say we're not reopening this year, next year we can look at a special one-off payment, we might be able to backdate it a bit. Is that the sort of fudge? And you know, because you're a negotiator, Mm. always requires a good bit of fudge to get a deal, saving face for both sides. Mm -hmm. Can that happen? Well, look, I think the first thing in order for a deal to be done is that the people who are the decision makers need to be in the room. And so, therefore, the problem we have at the moment is that he refuses to come in the room. It's only recently that we've even began to speak. We are talking 22-23. But, of course, we're negotiators. I do deals every day of my life. I'm in negotiations every day of my life for the last 30 years. So, obviously, we know how to do a deal. But it's got to be a deal that our members will accept. It can't just be um, a complete fudge where effectively people are not getting what they need to survive because you won't get people back into the NHS and if you don't do that, it doesn't exist. Now, a few weeks back, I interviewed you on the Today programme. Yes. And at the end of that interview, a former Tory cabinet minister sent me a text saying, I'm glad I'm not negotiating with her. Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) Where did the fight... Where did the toughness come from? Um, well, you know, I don't think you can ever pinpoint it yourself. I mean, I've always been somebody who's been quite determined and, you know, took on other people's fights, actually. Got myself in trouble a couple of times for it. Um, but I think probably looking back, you know, what do I think made me like this? I think probably hearing the story of my Uncle James, who my dad is a Geordie, um, and um, he, uh, my Uncle James died, my great-uncle James, died in a rock fall in a Durham pit in 1921. And I was eight when I first heard that story, around the breakfast table. I probably heard it before, but the first time I remember hearing it. And I was really scared because I thought, um, this person's gone out to work and they never came home and their children didn't have a father. And anyway, you know, I spoke to mum and dad, etc. And and I thought, well, at least that can't happen again. Thank God that can't happen again. And of course, can't it happen does again. happen. Why? Well, I thought it was so far in the past. I, at the time when I was 8, 9, 10, 11, I'm talking as a child now, I'm thinking, well, that's something that happened in the past. It will never happen again. But, of course, as I grew up, 
it does happen again. People still die at work right the way this pandemic. Uh, we've had workers dying at work and it's always working class people who are ended up thrown out there um, and end up dying at work. But did your family at that time, losing a relative, which must have been a very emotional mm. time, did they tell you what they thought the right reaction was? Was the right reaction politics? Was it trade unionism or were they not involved? Were they not active themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we spoke a lot about politics, small p, but we probably didn't even realise, you know, you don't really, as a child, you're not really realising what you're talking about. Um, but, um, you know, my, my mum, is, who's Irish, and uh, my dad's a Geordie, I mean, their reaction was it was the fault of the boss. And they were paid £300. This is my uncle's family in 1921. £300 in compensation, three children under 10 who didn't have their father. Um, and it affected my dad's family for a long time. It, it's not just that moment, is it? It's the effects that it has on the family for a long time. So um, injustice, I think, is probably what uh, we felt, so although you, I wouldn't know you, that at the time. Your dad, Tom. Yes. Your mum, Joan. Yes. One, your mum, Irish. She is. From a strong Irish family. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Your dad, <laughs> you moved to, they moved to West London, which is where you're brought up. Mm. But they weren't that political. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, they weren't that political. I mean, they worked in the hospitality industry. They both came here, uh, you know, in their in their teens, really. They met, you know, their 60-year anniversary actually is in June, so I've got to remember that. Um, so, so, you know, they, they sort of met very young. They got married very young. Um, but they've always been political in the small p sense, if there's such a thing. You know, they've, we've always spoken about what's happening. If I go to mum and dad's now, which I do uh, normally on a Friday evening, uh, there's always a conversation about the current affairs of the day. Yeah, absolutely. And you said you got into trouble sometimes fighting. Yes. Yeah. At home? Did you have to fight at home to get your fair share? Well, my first ever fair share, I say to my sister often, I got her a pay rise very early on because uh, it was about pocket money. My brother, Sean, is um, older than me. And uh, I think we were getting 50 pence, my sister and I, and he was getting a pound or something. It was way more than we were getting, I know that for sure. And my dad said, if you can come up with a proposal, an argument as to why you think you should get the same, I'll concede it. And I did. And what, you conceded. negotiated with your I own did. father about sex discrimination amongst I, the children? I absolutely did. And I absolutely did. And won. Um, and he used to work split shifts. So I think every time he came home, he was getting in his ear about this, <laughs> about this thing. Do you remember so, what argument you used? I think I was firstly about why, why did it cost more for him to live than me? What, what was, what were the, I mean, he was getting his bills paid. Everything was being paid. And um, he would be able to buy more sweets. And why was he able to buy more sweets? And I wasn't, we weren't, Tracy and I weren't able to buy more sweets. So yeah, it was probably childish. But, it, but the, what I think my dad quite liked is that I prepared it, I'd rehearsed it, and I, I, I answered questions on it. So um, he, he gave in, yeah. Now, a lot of working class <laughs> families where there's not a lot of money to go around. Yes. You fight over who gets a bigger share of the food. Did you have a bit of a... Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, I always say that I, I speak at pace, and I always think one of the reasons I speak at pace is you had to, to get into the conversation because everybody has an opinion and talking about uh, everything. Actually, my friends laugh at me often because uh, one of the things I quite like is alphabet spaghetti. And I think that's taken back from when I was a child. We used to have it on toast. But yeah, I mean, it's a normal working class family. Everybody has an opinion. Your and mum jumps says in. you used to fight for the cream on the top of the milk. Well, she, my, yeah, my mum does. Yeah, I'm very determined. I will. I will. I come from a, quite a strong uh, line of women, Irish women. My aunt is a very strong woman. My mum's very strong. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, absolutely, probably. Now, you leave school at 16. I do, yes. You follow your parents, at least in your first job, into the yes. hospitality trade. Yes. Into hotel. Is it true that in your first job, you lead a walkout? I did, actually. And, you know, looking back now, you're thinking, God, that was a bit, that was a bit pushy, wasn't it? I mean, basically what happened is within the hospitality industry, we used to do banquets. So without boring everyone to death, you had a table of 10, there might be 200 people in a room. Um, so this is posh catering. This is, it was posh, yeah, I was silver service, so you had to be able to do silver service to do it. And in that sort of a situation, there's a top table. I never did it, wasn't good enough for that. But there's a top table, and when the top table finishes, somebody puts up their hand and everyone one clear so the, the waitresses then clear the floor and what happened was a, a group of workers were coming in that were getting less than us per shift and we were saying the group of the waitresses were saying well hang on that means we're going to get less next time I mean they had quite good foresight it wasn't our wages that were less it was somebody else's coming in a group of people and for some reason it was me that was asked to uh, be the spokesperson which I did I remember distinctly it was like yesterday giving the arguments, very good arguments, I thought. Um, and it was the first time I thought weight of argument doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the right outcome. So I said... You're how old, though? I'm 17. 
I'm okay. 17, yes, I'm 17. So You're 17? I'm 17, yes. And you so do I'm... what? So you try negotiating, that doesn't work, and you yes. do what? Well, I went to the office to say, well, look, I think this is wrong because, you know, X, Y, Z argument. And then I came out and said, well, they're not, he's not listening to us, so we're going to have to do something else. And I came up with the idea, and, you know, looking back now, you think, God, it was, you know, where did that come from? Where effectively we'd serve the first course, but we wouldn't clear unless he agreed to what we'd asked. And it worked. Because, of course, the, the, the people are sitting there expecting their second course. So, you know, they're in the room. I mean, they're all there. They're right in the room. So we won. And actually, I You're did... in the middle. I want to know this. Yes. You're in the middle of the dinner. Yes. You're supposed to be clearing. Yes. The first course, what? And you go and see the boss and say, that's it. Well, no. So he's, no I more. Sp- I spoke to him prior to service started. He basically was very disparaging, I have to say. Um, and he was rather rude. Um, and uh, so I thought, OK, that, that's that's that ended. So I came out and said to the girls, as we would call each other then, um, oh, he's been absolutely so rude, etc. And we hadn't even started serving at this stage. So this is when we said, OK, we'll serve the first course. When they put their hand up to clear from behind the top table, we just won't move. And so in he comes, looking very annoyed and very blowy in the ears, um, going absolutely banana rama. And basically, he gave he gave the money. And actually, the, it, well, I felt very, very, you know, I felt very uh, satisfied about it. But uh, I was probably the youngest of the team, actually. But probably either the most stupid or the most brave. I don't know which one it was. To be honest with you, but yeah. Now yeah. you then go work for the TNG, as it used to be called, I did, Transport yeah, General yeah, Workers yeah, Union, yeah. and it merged to form this great super yes, union, Unite. Yes. 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 And you go to something I think a lot of people don't know exists, a trade mm. union academy. By the sounds of it, you should have been teaching them <laughs> rather than the other way around. Well, we, well, well the TUC did what was called an organising academy, where it was talking about the difference between just recruitment and organisation. And, you know, I understand why they did it and everything else, but uh, it was uh, it was good. There was lots of good things from it. There was lots of things I wouldn't have done. But I was there with a number of other people now who were doing different things in the trade union movement. So, yeah, it was a good initiative, definitely. Yeah. Now, the thing that brings you to this job is not public profile. You're a much lower profile trade unionist mm-hmm. than your predecessor, yes, Ben McCluskey. Yes. Is this organising, this idea that now attaches to your name that you came up with before you became General Secretary, what I think you call Strike Plus, don't mm-hmm. you? Other people call Leverage. Mm. What is it? Well, look, I mean, I made the decision when I stood that I thought what was really important for me as the General Secretary was to make sure that when I woke up in the morning, I was defending workers' jobs paying conditions. I ran on that manifesto, jobs paying conditions. And so um, I spend a lot of my time on picket lines and negotiating rooms with reps because I think that's the most important thing. So, of course, I do media when I need to do it, but really that's my main frame. And one of the things that I've done in the, the year that I've been in is to refocus the pretty much the entire union's resources onto the jobs paying conditions agenda. We've got forensic accountants for the first time, investigative researchers for the first time, economists for the first time. And so really driving that through. So just pause. Why does yes. a trade union need a forensic accountant? So this is what, a... what do they do? What are you doing differently so, from people's image yeah. of a trade unionist, which is haggling with the bosses and if you don't get your way going on strike? Because I think it's more complex than that now. Because actually for a lot, when it's a hostile employer, remember we do deals with employers all the time. There are good employers out there that we do deals with where you don't have strike action. They understand a piece of the pie must go to the workers. But the problem when a a, a bad employer puts a stake in the ground and you can't defeat that is it becomes a pattern. So basically um, why we brought the forensic accountants in is because when we go into negotiations now, we need to really understand the ability to pay of the employer, where money is moved, how it's moved. So you're following the money. Following the money, absolutely following the money. The other reason so um, in, in t- is to also make sure that we're able to push out the real choices in society. There's a, Narratives tend to happen and then unions either go, we don't like it or we do like it. Why can't we set narrative? Why can't we say, actually, Actually, the economy is broken, there's a different choice to make. So let's get a sense of how this works. Let's take yeah. an example. You okay. had a whole series of disputes with bus yes. companies, didn't you? Yes. Go ahead with one of the companies yes. that run the buses in yes. Manchester. Yes. So when you go into that negotiation, mm-hmm. armed with your forensic accounting, you're, I'm told, you've got a blooming great file, Norm, enormous lever arch file with information about that company. What were you able to do to concentrate their minds? Well, so the leverage stuff is slightly different. So the forensic accounts happen in every negotiation. That is essentially to make sure we understand the terrain of the company and that's, you know, that, that, our, our reps have that, etc. What the leverage is, and that they sometimes are a thousand pages long, um, is looking at the company as a whole. So a lot of the time, these companies are multinationals and the decisions aren't made here. They're made in another country. So in this particular example, there was a strike in the northwest of 500 bus drivers who were fired and rehired. 
And they've been on, on strike for weeks and the company was ignoring them. So what we did in this instance is that that same company was going for a Norwegian rail contract in Norway for £3.8 billion. Pounds. So that was worth a lot more to them than what they were going to save over firing and rehiring 500 people. So we did the whole campaign around that £3.8 billion pounds contract. We we basically went to Norway. We spoke to the politicians. We spoke about what was happening um, and effectively frustrating that bid to say, hang on, these people have fired and hired people in Britain. If you have them here, they are going to cause industrial unrest. And so the company makes a choice. Do I want that happening or do we go back to the negotiating table? So to put it simply in a way, you're finding out the soft, vulnerable points of an employer, not just the person in front of you, in order to target them wherever they are in the world. Yes, yeah, so we're saying you're a company as a whole, you're making profit from these workers because they're very profit-making, and actually you're using that profit to invest in other parts of the globe. So what happened didn't go ahead? Well, the fire and high didn't go ahead. and uh, They backed down. Well, I, when I was in the room with the CEO, he said, we will never use fire and rehire again. And so that was a really important moment. And obviously the fire and rehire didn't take place. I tell you why it was important, Nick, because this is important. It's it, People were saying to me at the time, there are 500 people in, in, in an area of the northwest. But had that gone through and uh, those workers were fired and rehired and their way, wages were suppressed, that would have happened through all of the company in the UK. Other bus companies might have followed suit. It's really important that stakes are put in the ground. And that's why it's only used in very hostile terrain. It's not used as a normal everyday business. But in other words... You see the job of a general secretary as, frankly, less of this, less of talking to people like me. I mean, one of your friends said, she's doing this because she has to. She doesn't much like doing it <laughs> media. Is that right? well, look, well, no, it's not that I like, like I'm having a very nice time. It's not that I don't like it. It's just that, you know, for me, what I think is the job, my job, the reason I took this job, the reason I went to be elected to our members was I wanted to refocus the union on jobs paying conditions, but to win for our members. We're not victims. Trade unions aren't victims. Um, and in, in order to win, it means it means that I need to be across all the disputes. I need to be involved where I need to be. And, and you say all time. the disputes. How many are we talking about at any one time? Well, last year we had 551 disputes last year. Um, and that covered over 100,000 Unite members. And we we won 80% of them. And now? Uh, we've got 147. So far. Right now. Uh, and there's 99 balloting currently. Um, so, so for me, and of course my job is to... As much, you don't win everything. That's not life. Okay, we, we, we understand that. But the whole thing around strikes plus is it's not full leverage, but it is this piece of understanding where the company is, where the money is, and making sure we use that to our advantage. Refocus the union. That was your pitch. It was, yeah. Which was essentially saying, I'm going to be as different from Len McCluskey as you can imagine. Len, love talking about the Labour Party, love being involved in politics, love talking a lot. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I, won't, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I won't uh, say that. What I'd say is this, is look, politics matters. I mean, I, the thing is, I'm not saying I'm not political because, of course, I am political. I'm the general secretary of a trade union, but I want to win. I want my members to win. And so the politics should be rooted in what our members are, are needing. Investment in manufacturing, obviously pay rises, all of these things. Now, when I talk to Keir Starmer, which I meet him, you know, often, um, our conversations around workers, what are we going to do to make the life of working people better? Mm -hmm. um, um, so the choices argument, you know, the choice, the different choices that need to be made, a whole range of different things. So, um, but for me, it's about making sure that the politics works for working people because yeah. that is my role. You've been pretty direct about that. Oh. Oh, you right? said at the TUC <laughs> conference of Keir Starmer, whose side are you on? Yes, I has did, he yes. chosen? Well, what I think about this is that the big question for 2023 is going to be who pays. Who pays for the crisis? Who pays for the black hole? Who, who pays? Um, and I think it's really important that Labour do not allow working people to pay for this. It's got to be paid in a different way. Do you we worry that they do want working people to do it? Because in order to win an election, mm. do you worry that they may have to sound like we're not going to really increase taxes and we're mm. not going to increase public spending, we don't want to increase borrowing, mm. that they end up having to be sort of shadow Tories? Well, I, I, I worry that I, I, what I think is if I said what I've just, you know, I've said to you about the profiteering of companies, 170 billion, we can get rid of the black hole. We could pay the NHS 10 percent. You still have change in your pocket. I think most people would say, well, actually, that's not a bad idea. Why don't we do that? The problem you've got is is everyone seems to be just keep going down the same stream. Um, and, you know, you can go slower, you can go faster, but it's still the same stream. 
I would like us to talk about, not, not to be afraid to talk about choices. I don't think the public would reject that. I think they would actually think, well, actually, why are we paying? So Who is, pays for this? You, you said last summer there isn't really a very strong voice for workers in Parliament. Mm. People sort of assumed that was the Labour Party that, you know, is such a big funder of. Is there now a voice well, what I would say about, for me, uh, you know, Keir's got his job, I've got mine. Um, and irrespective of governments, we need to win for workers. Because that's, that's, that's the difference. We need to win for workers irrespective. And I'll do everything I can to do that. Um, I expect Labour to be a strong voice for workers in Parliament. Because that's what they're there to do. But are um, they? Well, I'd like them to be better, Nick. Shall I say that? I mean, I'd like them to do better. Could do better, I would say. Is if going I was to doing Davos it. helping the workers? Well, look, what I'd say about going to Davos is that, look, I want businesses to do well. I mean, I sit down with CEOs all the time. I, 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 we talk about investment. I'm doing a, uh, some meetings next week uh, in car manufacturing because of the investment issues there. And um, so a lot of the time, my conversations with employers and stewards is how do we get more money in so that we can get more jobs and better jobs? So I've got no problem with him saying Britain's open for business because Britain is open for business. Um, but what I don't want him to forget is that workers need to get a fair share. That's the problem. You know, what if workers don't get a fair share, then then we this is an unequal society. Which means in essence being prepared to tax business more, doesn't it? Well, I think certainly the windfall tax needs to be clear. Um, and it needs to be done in a much cl clearer way so people understand what, what they've been asked. 170 billion pounds in in excess profit. That's excess, not normal, excess. I am almost scratching my head every morning thinking, why have we got a problem with saying some of that should be used for the black hole and to pay back for the crisis? Um, and so therefore, uh, for me, I want businesses to do well. I deal with them every day of my life because that means my members get paid well. But workers have to be in this equation. Now, there are two theories of Keir Starmer, and you know it better than most people. Mm -hmm. One is he's a radical pretending to be terribly moderate because that's how you get elected. And secondly is that he misrepresented himself. He pretended to agree with Jeremy Corbyn on a whole series of things, but in fact, he's a bit of a centrist. Who's right? Well, look, I mean, I don't know uh, who's right because obviously he'll have to answer that question himself. But what I do know is this, is that you cannot get into government just because you're better than the other lot. And I think the country is crying out now for a strong leadership to say, actually, we, we, we've got a different way. We've got solutions. I was actually thinking the other day, it's like... A, a, a bad tribute act. We've got the Tory party wanting to be Margaret Thatcher. We've got the Labour party wanting to be Tony Blair. Why can't we just say, what are the issues that are affecting workers today? What are the issues that are affecting our country today? And what choices can we make? And I think there are different choices to make that we are not speaking about, that we're not narrating. And I'm going to make sure that I, I do that in the hope that somebody will pick it up at some point. So when you hear the Labour leader talking of reforming the NHS and bring in private companies to help uh, cut the waiting list. That's a sort of bad tribute act to Tony Blair, is it? Well, look, what I think about the NHS is what everybody has to see about it. Nothing will happen in the NHS till they deal with the crisis of workers. Nothing will happen until that happens. I just and wonder what made you say bad tribute act? Well, what, I mean... What, what is a bad tribute act? I mean, base, because, it's, because people are trying to emulate the past and we're not in the past. Actually, we're in a yeah, very different place. But what's an example place. of that? Well, I suppose, you know, things around, uh, you know, the NHS is an example. So some of the language is very similar in terms of what's been said around the NHS and reform. Um, I think it that annoys workers in, in the NHS because uh, what they're saying is actually come out and talk about pay. Let's get the crisis, the, the, the staff crisis sorted out. And then we can talk about whatever needs to be done after that. So it's just it just feels like, look, we're a country that needs to be looking at the issues we've got right now and the choices we need to make and also how we deal with those issues. And it feels a little bit like everybody's looking behind them instead of looking in front of them. Now, you've got leverage yes. to talk about it with the Labour Party. You are yes. still... You know, the biggest funder of the yes, Labour Party. Yes, we are, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Now, when you went into dispute with a particular Labour council in Coventry, you said, let me be very clear, the remaining financial support of the Labour Party is now under review. Mm -hmm. Will you use the tactics you used against Go Ahead or British Airways and others? With the Labour Party to say, if you don't give us what you want, you don't get the cash. Well, that's quite a blunt instrument because, of course, um, in a sense, that's, you know, our, our, our affiliation to the Labour Party is, is in rule, actually. So at every rules conference, it comes up for debate. I'm sure it will this time round. Um, and then it's either in rule or it's not. So, so our affiliation is paid uh, to them. What I haven't done is added any more money onto that. There used to be quite a lot of money added on. I haven't, I haven't done that. But actually, the biggest lever for the Labour Party is the public. 
that's the biggest lever for the Labour Party. I'm, I mean, we, we are in, there's something uh, called uh, the economy's not working, which I won't go into in, in great detail. But we are in constituencies. Unite has people in constituencies talking to them. And actually, the stuff that we're talking about, renationalisation of energy, uh, the stuff around the NHS, how you make different choices, who pays, people are, are actually interested in that. That's they, Those are very clear messages. Now, we've talked of you having to be a fighter, fighter at yes. home to a certain extent, fighter against injustice in the workplace. You also had to have a fight to become leader of this union. They, mm. they tried to bully you into not running, didn't they? Well, there was, a, yeah, I, I, mean, I remember when I first thought um, about running. And actually, the reason I ran was because I wanted to change the union um, into, you know, I wanted to drive us into a much more focused jobs paying conditions agenda with politics, but focus from the members. Um, and um, yes, I mean, I knew that I was going to get uh, attacks. I knew that because, I mean, you, you know, I did know that. But abuse, I, not just attacks. Attacks, abuse, a whole range of different things happened uh, in in that election. Um, and um, I spoke to my parents. I spoke to my, 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 my husband and my son and, um, you know, to inoculate them, actually, that this was this was what was going to be where we are. Why were you sure you'd face that? Because, you know, because oh, look, we're a political organisation. I wasn't the anointed son. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, ha you know, I wasn't following the line uh, in, in terms of that. And I wasn't following the line because I didn't agree with the line. And I thought that our union needed to be going into the, into a direction of jobs paying conditions. And when we did that, we would win more. And that's what's happened. You did something else that upset them, didn't you? You said that row about the hotel and the conference centre in Birmingham, that row about millions of pounds... I'm not going to ignore it anymore. Mm. So, yeah, so actually, in a strange way, that probably is where a lot of, most of the, uh, most of the threats came in after I had uh, become General Secretary. But the thing for me is this. Um, I came in, no one does this job if you, if you haven't got elbows. I mean, you need to come in and do exactly what you say you're going to do um, and people will respect you for that. So um, there was going to be no stone unturned. If there was something there, we needed to find it out and face it. Literally. And so there were two inquiries I did, one into the Birmingham Hotel um, and one into uh, our outsource, uh, outsource contractors. And the first and one, for people done. who don't follow the details, almost yes. 100 million quid. Yes. Which yeah. the police are looking into. So, so the difference was 31 million, but yes, yes. We, we paid 100 million to, to do it, but the difference was 31 million. Yeah. Difference from? So from? From what we thought we should have paid to what we actually paid. And you, so the question is, how? why is that? That's the question. Do you yeah. fear there was corruption? Well, we, I don't know. And what I do know is this. We paid more than £31 million over. It came out in invoices. We either got fleeced by every contractor going um, or there was another reason for it. Now, I don't know what the, what the reason is. That's why the police have it. And, and so they're the people to make that mark because I don't know. I can't look into the things that they can look into. But what I do know is that we were at best overcharged. I mean, the report can't give the outcome because all the, what the report is looking at is how much money did we spend, how much money was it? Yeah. And when you did say, look, I'm going to front this up, I'm going to look into it, I'm going to call it out, mm -hmm. what was the reaction? Well, it was, uh, it was it, you know, I got a lot of flack for it. Um, you know, flack a lot like... of, well, you know, I mean, I suppose some people might call it threats. I'm, I'm sort of a, bit of a tough person, so I just like, well, you know, it was water for ducks back because it was going to happen. And even up to now, this whole thing about publishing them, etc. but they will be published. I mean, I, I've come in... I've done the inquiry. It's either we've either been fleeced by contractors or it's something else. Whatever it is, I'll be going after that money to get it back, whoever and whatever it is. Um, and uh, in the meantime, the police have the reports. They have both reports. Um, and once they've done what they need to do, then I will do what we would need to do. But, you know, it had to be done, Nick. And, you know, you can't shy away from these things. You've got to do That's what leadership's about. I heard one story that four men came up to you and said, don't do this or else. Well, there was there was definitely threats. There was def there was definitely threats. But you know, the, um, I didn't. I, I expected that to happen. I expected that to happen. And uh, you know, obviously, I'm a I, I'm I'm dealing with it. Yeah. Yeah, and have extraordinary levels of composure. It would seem. <laughs> How? What calms you down, the leader of Unite, when you just need to say, "Look, I'm having a fight." In the Unum, having a fight <laughs> sometimes with Keir Starmer, maybe certainly with employers all the time. What? What allows you to kind of just stay Well, calm? I mean, I suppose it might be a boring answer, but my, I'm lucky to have my mum and dad still alive. So I, I live five roads away from them. We're a bit like the Brady Bunch. We, we're all sort of really <laughs> stones throw away from each other. Um, so I have to say going to them, going and seeing them, which I can, you know, do, you know, and speaking to them, great. Obviously, we all, you know, my mum's Irish. I was brought up in Irish music. So, uh, you know, a nice little Irish club somewhere is probably quite a nice thing as well. Bit of singing? Uh, yes, there's all, well, uh, family dues, there's always singing. I, I said to my friends uh, when I first 
became general secretary, who I've been friends of mine since they were, I was 11, so long-term friends, then my karaoke days are over, unfortunately, for a bit anyway. So uh, so obviously that won't be happening Was it soon. true or are you still singing occasionally? Well, in closed doors, probably, when yeah, people can't what, hear me. Then? What would you say? So, Rumour has it Dolly Partners featured. Oh, nine to five. I think I might have done that a couple of times. Yeah, I mean, I mean, mostly Irish songs, though, Nick. Mostly Irish songs. And, Depends how many wines you've had, I suppose. And football. Yes. You're football. still a Newcastle fan. Yeah, well, my dad's a Geordie, so anyone who's got a father as a Geordie will know there is absolutely no way you couldn't. My son, who supports... Uh, Fulham because my husband does. My dad got keeps getting him Newcastle tots with his name on so that we can't throw them away. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, he keeps doing that. So, so yeah, I mean, you can't be uh, the daughter of a Georgie father and support anyone else, to be honest. Even with Saudi owners? Well, this is, yeah, there is. I mean, I, ha I at the moment, I'm sort of like saying it with my hands across my mouth. But yeah, I mean, that is unfortunate. The whole thing around money and the premiership and who owns it and all of those things are, you know, questions to be asked in society, aren't they, really? So, yeah. Well, it is interesting that in a way that football and the way it has been dragged away from mm. its working class, from its community it. roots mm. to this sort of global mm. play thing, mm. originally for rich people, now for states. Yeah. Tells yeah. you quite a lot about society. Quite, and actually, I think it's an error because to pay for your child and a family to go to football, who could afford to do that? I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it is it is so expensive that actually, you know, football was a working class game because people played it and then they went to watch it and then they went, then they followed people and then that well, they became very passionate about it. And um, if you're pricing people out of the game, which is really what's happening, then actually they might choose another route, you know, in terms of that. So I think it's a real shame. And of course, some of the smaller clubs now are are, are folding, which of course is also a real shame. So yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult area uh, football. I mean, you, I, I, I love Newcastle. I want them to win. But obviously, you know, there are problems with the game. And a final thought. Could you have leveraged that deal? Was there a way of persuading people not to let the Saudis take over or just to pick a club at random? Manchester United. <laughs> <laughs> If you wanted to stop them being taken over by... Well, I, I believe, actually... The you know, wrong regime. If, if, if only we had time to do it. Actually, uh, the, the, the power of the collective and, and the people saying no to something is the one thing politicians really get and understand. Um, and that will be the same for whomever is, uh, you know, whoever whoever is involved in running football. But, yes, I think there's always leverage to be to be done, Nick, where, where you've got time to do it. Yes. Sharon Graham, General Secretary of UNI, I'll come to you for some more specific campaigning advice. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks yes, for joining you. me on Political Thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sharon Graham says she's driven by a desire to win. And the argument about what will win for the left in politics, whether it is her assertiveness or what she derides, as a Tony Blair tribute act, that is going to shape the politics of the next 12 months and beyond.